if you get community right, you can reduce acquisition costs, content creation costs, and you can drive referrals, word of mouth, and the brand narrative in ways that are really unprecedented for marketers. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Growth Hacks, a podcast from TCV where we discuss strategies and secrets to unlocking high growth with CMOs, CROs, and growth-minded leaders. I'm Kunal Mehta, and I'm a principal at TCV focused on go-to-market strategy. And I'm Katya Gagan, principal at TCV and head of marketing. Join us as we bring you the growth and marketing playbooks from technology's best and brightest, and chat with operators as they are in the process of innovating. This is Growth Hacks. Folks, I'm pleased to introduce our guest today, Jonathan Mildenhall. Not only was Jonathan the former CMO of Airbnb, he was also named a top 10 influential marketer by AdAge. He's the father of young twins and an incredible community builder and founder of 21st Century Brand. Jonathan Mildenhall, welcome to Growth Hacks. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I always love engaging with you and Katia, so uh, I'm looking forward to this session. Thanks for joining us, Jonathan. Let's dive right in. One of the things, Jonathan, we've talked a lot about with you is community building and how easily it is said and how difficult it is to get it right. Talk us a little bit about how you build community. Mm, Yeah, well, community is one of the four pillars of building a 21st century brand. Pillar number one is purpose and being purpose-driven. Pillar number two is community and having the community do a lot of the hard work for you. Pillar number three is technology, making sure your technology is human in its very design. And pillar number four is story and storytelling. So let's deep dive into community. If you get community right, you can reduce acquisition costs, content creation costs, and you can drive referrals, word of mouth, and the brand narrative in ways that are really unprecedented for marketers. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. In 2014, when I got to Airbnb, there were only 400,000 homes on the platform. And I realized very, very quickly that if I was to compete with Booking.com's extraordinary $2.2 billion marketing budget, when I only had a $25 million marketing budget on a global basis, I needed to get the host community specifically to do a lot of the heavy lifting with me. And so we reached out to the host community and said, look, we are interested in your experiences. We're interested in your stories. If you've got great stories, share them with us and we'll help turn them into marketing collateral. And so once we started to get the community stories driving the brand narrative, we were able to also work with the community to get them to advocate on our behalf. And what do I mean by that? Well, in 2014, Airbnb was still working with cities all over the world to become a legitimate home sharing business. And each city has different laws, different requirements that Airbnb was prepared to work with. And it was the host communities that turned up in the local town halls to advocate on Airbnb's behalf. And without the host communities, Airbnb wouldn't have been as successful developing laws, principles, and guidelines that were right for each city. And every city's playbook for Airbnb is slightly different. Once we were able to see the value of an engaged host community, we turned that into the traveler community. And the traveler community started to share their inspirational stories about their travel experiences on Airbnb. And we saw incredible content developed. The guest community on Airbnb have even written books that have been bestsellers on what it's like spending three years traveling around the world on Airbnb. There have been documentaries, broadcasts on YouTube about guests traveling on Airbnb. And each one of those content creators has been recognized by Airbnb and so feels valued and so therefore continues to publish incredible stories and content about the world as it should be traveling on Airbnb. Fantastic, Jonathan. Let me ask you, when it comes to community, a lot of 
our portfolio companies make certain mistakes or missteps. Maybe you can talk to some of the things that you're seeing as well. Managing the community is a ongoing strategic initiative. And by that, I mean, you can't just dip in and out of the community and ask the community for ideas and then not respond to those ideas. I'll give you two very high profile examples. About two years ago, Jack Dorsey asked his Twitter community to come up with product ideas to improve Twitter and Twitter's role in the world. And it created one of the biggest conversations of community engagement around Jack Dorsey and his leadership of Twitter in a very, very positive way. About six months after that success, Brian Chesky did exactly the same. Using Twitter, he gave an open call for ideas, products, and services to help improve the Airbnb guest and host experience. And again, that was one of the most popular conversations that Brian held with his community to generate really interesting ideas that would create significant value for the community. The reason why I give you those two examples is community management should not be delegated to the most junior ranks of somebody in a marketing department. Both Twitter with Jack Dorsey and Airbnb with Brian Chesky see the absolute significance of their leadership being used to engage the community in a very, very powerful way. So one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they think that they can turn on and turn off community engagement, which is very short-sighted. And they also think that they can relegate community management to the most junior ranks of an organization when, in fact, the chief executive's voice and presence needs to be heard. Outstanding. So, Jonathan, just pivoting a bit, you're now the CEO of 21st Century Brand. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your company and what your values are and what your goal is with the company and the brands you work with now. I set up 21st Century Brand in 2018 with my co-founder, Neil Barry. And Neil is now the global chief exec of 21st Century Brand. And I'm actually the chairman of that company. 21st Century Brand is absolutely committed to working with the most brand ambitious founders and chief executives on the planet that have created and conceived some of the most innovative companies on the planet. And I'm so proud to say that we worked with Uber, Peloton, Pinterest, and we're a strategic outfit. There are about 35 of us now in London and in the West Coast here in uh, the US. And our sweet spot is pre-IPO, helping companies really make sure that the community narrative, the investor narrative, the employee narrative, and the brand narrative is really robustly integrated so that we can ensure a successful and sustainable IPO debut. Wow, that's quite something, Jonathan. (laughs) And you're working with a lot of great brands and household names, and I'm sure you also have some other hidden gems in the portfolio. If you're thinking about becoming a category-defining company and want to build out your brand, how do you go about it? Honestly, part of... Our 21st century brand process is what I call, it sounds terrible because it sounds as if you're having a facial, but I I call it deep extraction because these men and women that found or lead companies have an instinct as to why the company matters and an instinct as to how big the company can be. And when I say big, I don't just mean in total numbers and size of revenue, but I mean in terms of its cultural impact. We like to say we're kind of revealing the soul of the company and the purpose of the company back to the founding team who created the company. But quite often, the founding team gets so entrenched in the business and they get so pulled into the coalface that they find it difficult to step back and just ask honest questions about, what it is that we were originally trying to do. And so our process is to pull it all out of the client and then join the dots in a surprising but familiar fashion. And if anybody would say anything about me and my company, they would say that we help them 
truly understand who it is that they were meant to be. And as a result of a clear narrative, we can now activate those four pillars of becoming a 21st century brand. As a reminder, it's purpose-driven, it's community-led, it's technology-enabled, and it's excellence in story. Uh, And as soon as we've been able to pull out the strategic blueprint for the company, then we know how to activate each of those four pillars, which should, in total combination, give each of our clients a disproportionate advantage in beating the competition and therefore becoming category defining. I love that, Jonathan. I think it's just one of the best ways to explain how a company can help another company really just pop on how they tell their story. What's kind of the company you admire the most today and why? Oh, I love that question. Because it does differ in many, many ways. So let me see if I can use the four pillars to give you four answers. I've recently joined the board of GoFundMe. And the reason why I joined the board of GoFundMe is I cannot truly think of another company, another brand, another platform that fuses purpose and profit in a really integrated way. And the more successful GoFundMe is, the more beneficial its community is in terms of having some of their needs and some of their dreams realized. And of course, the more needs and dreams are realized on GoFundMe, the greater the profit. And so I just love how integrated the purpose narrative is and the profit narrative is on GoFundMe. In terms of community driven, I really, really respect Glossier. Emily Wise, a fantastic founder and CEO, started Glossier as a beauty blog. And she realized the rampant engagement of her community that she was like, I think we could actually start designing product together and designing makeup together. She's designing product, naming product, trialing product, getting word of mouth advocacy to be so rampant that Glossier is one of the most efficient beauty brands to generate engagement and generate growth. And then technology enabled. I really think that Peloton, it's such simple technology, but it's transformed so, so many lives. I wouldn't have been able to get through the COVID pandemic had it have not been for Peloton and how Peloton uses technology to make my engagement with my fitness feel so uplifting and so uniting to their community. And then in terms of storytelling, the fourth pillar, I would have to say that the work that Brian Chesky continues to do at Airbnb is just truly astounding. And the thing that I'd point out to with Airbnb is that Brian and the executive team there use powerful storytelling, even during their most darkest times. And an illustration of that is in March 2000. 19, Airbnb had to let 20% of its headcount go. Uh, And it was a brutal, brutal moment for everybody at Airbnb, a brutal moment, the darkest of times. And it's available online, but any founder or CEO who's thinking about the power of storytelling during a company's really dark times, when you're faced with crisis or you have to let people go, then please, please read Brian Chesky's email to his community as to the reason why times were hard, what he intended to do about it, how he was going to return the focus back to basics and how he was going to elevate the host experience all over again. That email, even though it breaks my heart because of how difficult it was for Brian at the time, is one of the finest examples of powerful, purpose-driven storytelling I love that. And also, Jonathan, as you said, everyone, I think, can laugh and smile and show heart when the sun is shining. But what happens when there's some clouds on the horizon? How do you show your heart then? And that's, I think, when the true colors of any company come to light. And we've seen that with Airbnb. So thanks for sharing that again. And Katya, you're so right. It's so easy 
when everything is going right and upwards and, and it, it's bright and it's like, yeah, I can create alignment. As soon as you start to face crisis, that's when the real spirit of a company is tested. That's when the spirit and integrity of leaders are tested. And that is when the authenticity of brands are tested in the hearts and minds of consumers. I love that. So, Jonathan, we're going to finish this podcast with a little lightning round. You are the father of two year olds. What have you learned about yourself as a parent? Oh, right. Well, and to be honest, I read 14 books in my preparation to become a father. And actually, 13 of them were a waste of time. The only one book that mattered was called The Conscious Parent. And The Conscious Parent is an incredible book by Shifali Tatsbury, a doctor, And the principle here is that parents do not choose the spirit of their children. Children choose the spirits of their parents. And so by that, she means that every single child has been sent to a parent so that the parent can learn from the child. And she also tries to get you to meditate in the moment in terms of your parenting experiences. So if you feel frustrated as a result of the actions and behavior of your child, if you can step outside of the moment and just go, what is my child trying to teach me in this moment? Quite often the answer to that is kindness and patience. And what I have learned through the experience of being a father of a set of twins is that we can all be a little kinder to each other And we all need to be a little more patient with each other. And I love that because actually it's helped the way I show up in the world. Every day with everybody that I work with, I'm now conscious of the value of being kinder and the value of being more patient. You know, I have three daughters, Jonathan, and the sun could rise and set without me getting a word in. So I've had to, <laughs> I've had to learn extreme patience. But I'm going to put that book on my list for sure. I think that's, that's well explained. Shifting quite a bit, what's your biggest pet peeve? You know, there's a lot of entitlement in the workforce right now. I was very, very surprised. I left the Coca-Cola company where every single member of staff had to pay for their lunch in canteens, you know, terrible food at an exorbitant price. And then I moved to Silicon Valley and I see that Google and Facebook and Airbnb, everybody's offering organic food 24-7, you know, coddling the workforce. And that has led to a lot of entitlement in the workforce. I feel that every time I'm working with any client, even now doing this podcast, I feel so grateful that somebody is prepared to give me time. And I just think that we could all express a little more gratitude inside the workplace for the opportunity to do the work that we do, building some of the most important companies on the planet. And gratitude is another thing that I practice daily. And I, I just think work would be a whole lot more enjoyable if we all practiced more gratitude with each other. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. I have one last question. We work with both B2C and B2B companies, right? And We're hearing a lot that some of our enterprise companies are looking into the consumer space for some lessons that they can apply in their business. What's your take on that? One of my big pet peeves is that B2B marketing teams forget that one of the Bs in the B2B is actually a human being. And we see so much cold, sterile, poorly designed terrible messaging going out to the customer on a B2B business. And yet that customer is the same human being that is buying Airbnb, buying Glossier, and we're not putting enough human understanding, empathy, creativity, design into the B2B consumer. And it is extraordinary because You know, when we were at Airbnb, we started off as a B2C brand, but then we built the business travel product and the same person that was booking their personal family vacation on Airbnb. Same with Uber for business, same with Peloton for business. So the one thing that I would ask everybody to really, really think hard about is who is the human being that is receiving this message and why should they care about this message and Does this message move them emotionally? Because you cannot be a B2C brand 
without moving people emotionally. And I would love it if B2B businesses made a greater effort to move their audiences emotionally and treat them as human beings as opposed to somebody that is on the other side of a business transaction. You're so right, Jonathan. I think a lot of our CMOs get paid for activity. So you see a lot of stuff created, but without that design point you just said, I think it's an incredible point to end on. Yes, thanks for being with us, Jonathan. I know we could have talked for many more hours, but I'm glad we covered a lot from community building to what it takes to build a brand today. And most importantly, how companies and brands can show their heart in good times and bad. Thanks for joining us today, Jonathan. You know, I love my relationship with TCV. I always, always feel a better human being after I've engaged with you, Katia, or you, Canal. So just thank you for having me on. I hope that the listeners have found it useful. Thanks for listening to Growth Hacks. You can follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. To learn more about us and TCV CEO and founder podcast, go to tcv.com or email us at growthhacks at tcv.com.